asking the most difficult questions about life, our society, and the world economy at large. The answers we seek are inextricably linked to the commitments we make and the actions we take. At the Institute of Certified Chartered Economists, ICCE, our commitment is to raise professional economists with the highest ethical standards through quality education and collaborative learning. Our global network of economists professionals are challenging conventional wisdom, advancing ideas, and contributing to the transformational agenda of the world economy. ICCE is raising economists globally, and you too can be one. Make the smart choice and become an ICCE charter holder today. Join the ICCE today and let's measure up www.charteredeconomists.org. Hello everyone, uh, good evening, good afternoon, uh, good morning to you uh, from wherever you're joining us from. Uh, we are very privileged to have you join us for today's webinar on income inequality. And this webinar is brought to you by the Institute of Certified Chartered Economies, the ICCE. Uh, this is in relation to a series of webinars that we've been hosting uh, on various topics in the last couple of weeks. And today we are privileged again to come your way with yet a very exciting and important topic uh, in the world economy today, which is on income inequality. So today we will have the opportunity to delve deeper into uh, how and why issues of income inequality uh, is very important to us, uh, to the world economy, especially to uh, people living in the global south which means those in emerging market, uh, which also forms about 70% of the global population. Uh, concerns about the gap between the rich and the poor, how does that really matter? And what will be the policy response uh, in times like this that we're seeing the gap between the rich and the poor widening? So we will have the opportunity to interact with our, our uh, esteemed speaker today. Uh, who will share the insight with us. And of course, we will have the chance to ask questions. So this is how the whole webinar is structured. So my name is Paul Frimpong. I'm the Global Head of Strategy and Membership at the Institute of Certified Chartered Economy, the ICCE. And I'll be your host and moderator uh, for today's webinar. Uh, in due time, I will introduce our speaker for today, who will then take us through uh, his insight through PowerPoint presentation. Uh, thereafter, we will have a Q&A session. So uh, that means that we are going to involve you uh, to be part of the webinar. So if you have any questions regarding the topic of today, we will have the chance to send in those questions and our speaker will duly respond to them. And then we'll come to the close of today's webinar. But before that, and of course, for the benefit of those uh, that are joining us for the first time, I will just take the next uh, uh, 120, uh, seconds to briefly uh, tell you more about the ICC, who we are and what we do and how you can be a part of the ICC from wherever you're joining us from. In the same time, I will put in the link, the chat box, our website address, so you can visit at your own time and then you can read more about the ICC and what we are doing uh, to raise professional economics. So uh, if you permit me, I will just share my screen briefly. So the ICC or the Institute of Certified Chartered Economists is a qualification for today and tomorrow's economists. So the Institute exists to provide qualification for all individuals that are interested in pursuing a career as economists. So you can either be uh, involved in any other profession or you already uh, have economist background and you want to be part of this professional association. 
So our vision is to raise economics professionals with the highest ethical standards through quality education and collaborative learning. And as we have it, we have astute professionals uh, from both academia and industry who are uh, supporting and driving the vision for the ICC. So we have Dr. Frank Luthier, who is now a senior partner and CEO at Sandbridge Investment, a former vice president of the World Bank Group, a former vice president of the African Development Bank. We have Professor H.K. Pradhan, who is a professor of finance and economics at SLRI in India. Dr. Mustafa Ibn Mouama, associate professor of economics in the University of New Brunswick. Dr. Lalima Makaji, she is a professor of economics in the University of Engineering and Management in Calcutta in India. Uh, Dr. M. Azar Hussein, uh, Associate Professor of Economics at Rochdale University in Denmark, who happens to be our speaker for today. We have Tanili Masia, Chief Economist Dutch Bank in South Africa. Dr. Barun Taka, Associate Professor of Economics at Flame University. My very self uh, as the Head of Global Strategy and Membership, and my colleague Gaurish Lagu, who is the Global Head of Partnership with the ICC. So this is currently the leadership of the ICC who are championing the platform the opportunity for people to be trained in the economics. So it's a membership-based organization. Uh, so uh, we are open for application from people and the minimum qualification that you must be admitted to a bachelor's degree or equivalent and first year students are allowed to apply. Uh, otherwise we have MPhil, PhD, uh, you know, bachelor's degree, what have you, you can apply to be part of the ICC. So the process leading to you becoming a chartered economist is that you are uh, required to go through some examinations, uh, which are structured in three levels, level one, level two, level three, as well as professional specialization. So at each level, we have a number of papers that you're supposed to write. And then when you finish that level one, you move to level two in that order. And the pass mark for our exams is 50%. So as long as you get 50% in each of the papers, you can move on to the next level. Uh, so this is the curriculum. So level one contains four papers, level two, uh, five, level three, uh, four, we have macro, micro, econometrics, international finance, international trade. I'll put a link in our chat box so you can visit the curriculum page on our website to have more information on exactly what are the papers that you want to take as an ICC learner. And of course, we have specializations in various fields, so you can uh, specialize in financial economics, you can become petroleum economist, energy economist, health economist, managerial economist, marine, labor, industrial, and what have you. So you have the chance after completing the first three levels to pick any of these areas and then you can specialize uh, in it. There are fees that apply. I'll put a link again in our chat box so you can have a look. And of course, we are offering scholarship to our learners. So if you happen to be a registered learner of the ICC, you can apply for the ICC scholarship. Uh, we're offering four uh, scholarship streams. So we have Future Economic Scholarship, which is available to every uh, learner of the ICC. We have Women Economist Network Scholarship, only for female uh, learners of the ICC. We have Media Professionals, only for people uh, in the media who are uh, presenting on business, economics, finance. And of course, we have faculty for any tutor uh, you know, uh, or head of department or who this is a minimum of credit hours in economics at any uh, tertiary institution. So the process is very simple for you to begin your membership at the ICC. You have to apply online via our website, www.chartedeconomy.org. I will put a link again in our chat box so you can visit and then you have the chance to apply to become a member. So thank you very much for uh, granting me your audience to brief you about the ICC. Again, for uh, those that are working in government and private organization, the ICC can also support you in your policy uh, directive through our advisory division. So on this note, I uh, will say thank you and I welcome you once again to today's uh, webinar on income inequality. So uh, Dr. Azar, if you are here, I think maybe, yes. Perfect. So uh, it's an honor for me to introduce to you uh, our speaker for today and our presenter for today. Uh, so I will just briefly read his profile. So Dr. M. Azar Hussein is Associate Professor of Economics and Statistics at the Department of Science and Business at Royal University, uh, ROC, which is based in Denmark. And he has a long career within academia where he teaches economics, 
uh, statistics and subjects you know, relating to uh, welfare, uh, which includes inequality, deprivation, poverty, uh, polarization, and socioeconomic indicators. So clearly he has the right profile to lead us through this. So uh, previously, uh, he has held various positions in economics field. He was head of section at the Danish Ministry of Economic Affairs, where he developed micro simulation models for taxes and social transfers using representative administrative data from uh, Statistics Denmark. He has had a long stay outside of Denmark, including during his PhD study in the USA at Cornell University, a technical resident advisor in Mozambique, at the Ministry of Planning and Development, as well as associate professor in the UAE. So Dr. Hussein has a vast publication record, including publication in peer review, international and Danish journals, books and book chapters for international and Danish publishers, and occasionally articles in Danish national media. So ladies and gentlemen, with uh, utmost honor, I welcome uh, Dr. M. Azar Hussein, who is also a member of the international board of stand up of the ICC. So Dr. Azar, please, uh, you may take over and, and share with us the insight that you have relating to this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, let me just open my presentation and share the screen. It should be right here. Correct. OK. Yes, uh, so I will be talking about uh, the uh, issue about inequality uh, from an economic uh, perspective. And uh, the things I will be talking about is, first of all, give you an introduction to the issues uh, that we are facing and that I will be talking about. I'll be talking about different approaches to analyzing inequality. And first of all, there is this widespread way of analyzing it through the Gini coefficient, which I think most of you uh, have probably seen before. Uh, but so I will only talk briefly about that. But I will also be looking at new evidence uh, about inequality. And the approach taken there is through deprivations. Uh, this is still economical, but in a bit of a different way compared to the Gini coefficient. Also, when we talk about deprivations, that very naturally leads also to what we call multidimensional uh, poverty analysis. And this is uh, another of the topic that I will be looking at. And finally, I will be looking at uh, different multidimensional analysis, which includes weighting as well as no weighting schemes. And the reason for looking into that also uh, should be clear uh, very fast as well. At least uh, when this uh, lecture is over, it should be clear why this is so important. So first of all, we can ask related to inequality, why is it so important to rank, for instance, countries? Why is it important to rank regions within a country, for instance, provinces or districts? Why is it important to rank different population subgroups within a country? Because this is basically what we are trying to do here. And the central reason is that many of us, we have an aim of reducing poverty, surely uh, also inequality uh, if possible. And if we want to do that, we must know how different groups are ranked according to whatever welfare measure we are using income or deprivation or whatever. So if we have information about how different groups they are faring compared to others, this would be important information for the policymakers because we would know, well, which uh, uh, group should we ta uh, target in order to reduce welfare disparities in the population. So in order to reduce poverty, in order to reduce inequality, we would need some kind of ranking of whatever group we are looking at. Uh, in this session here, we will mostly be looking at countries, but all the methodologies equally well applies within countries uh, and could also be within uh, uh, regions of a country. So let me briefly talk about 
uh, the one dimensional approach to inequality. And uh, this is also, you can say, the traditional approach, meaning we are having only one variable, one measure of welfare, and this has often been income. So this is what uh, we'll be looking at. In some countries, the income uh, concept doesn't make much sense uh, because people are working on their own business or working in agriculture. And in that case, we often use whatever consumption has taken place as a measure of welfare for the individual and for the family. Using the income definition, we need different concepts, which I will just briefly go through in order to have an idea what does the income look like that we're looking at. So first of all, we must have all the incomes and transfers that a family receives or earns. Then we also need to deduct taxes and mandatory contributions, which goes to the government. And what is left in a household would then be gross income minus taxes. And this is what we would call our disposable income. Now, of course, a big family will have a bigger disposable income on average compared to a small family. But of course, the consumption requirements are also different. How do we take the family consumption requirements into account? And how do we take into account the fact that we have economies of scales, the bigger the family is. And this is done through what we call equivalent scales, where we calculate how many adult equivalents uh, are there in a family. And here, the first adult counts as one, and all additional adults come as a half, and every child counts as 0.3. And this is, as I said, because of economies of scales and because children have uh, less requirement compared to adults. In any case, so what income concept is used in the end whenever we do inequality analysis? Well, that would be our disposable income over the equivalent scale, equivalent weights. So sometimes this is called a per capita income. This is not exactly per capita, but it's a kind of per capita income where we use adult equivalents. And if we do not have income at our disposal, uh, particularly for developing countries, we would then be using a consumption definition. And this is simply uh, the total expenditure on food and non-food items that a household has. Having that, we are then able to look at inequality, and this is done through the Gini coefficient, which is a widespread measure of inequality. The formula for the Gini coefficient is exactly as uh, you can see here. I'm not going to go into detail uh, about this, but basically what you need to know is that uh, N is the number of people in a country, mu represents the average income of a country, and here you see the absolute value uh, of income between any two people, okay? So in this sense, this measures the uh, differences in income that exists in a country. This formula uh, is exactly equal to the last expression, and the last expression would be the one you would uh, usually implement in a computer program because it only sums over uh, uh, all the people rather than over all the people uh, many times. The Gini, Gini coefficient is between zero and one, zero meaning perfect equality and one meaning perfect inequality. There are also other measures of inequality. We have, for instance, the generalized entropy index, which is decomposable. This is a big advantage. And otherwise we also have percentile ratios of different kinds. One problem with them is that uh, it doesn't cover uh, the entire distribution. We have these different measures, but often uh, you will have a high correlation with the Gini coefficient. And also the Gini coefficient is the most widespread measure used. So let's go for the Gini coefficient at the moment. The data we are using is from the World Bank. They have uh, world development indicators and uh, that 
covers the Gini coefficients for many countries. Although it is a world organization, it does not actually include all the countries. And it is not because they don't want to include all countries, but the problem is simply that not all countries has the required data. Also, even though some countries have uh, data, they don't have it for all the years. So that is another problem. It can be a problem to look at inequality over time. Finally, in the uh, analysis that's going on uh, in the next uh, few minutes, uh, we must remember that, that this is unweighted data that we are using. And it means that big and small countries weigh exactly the same. So Luxembourg with only 600,000 inhabitants has the same weight as China with 1.4 billion people. Let's briefly look at what the inequality look like right now. And here I have calculated and presented the uh, countries with the highest inequality and the countries with the lowest inequality. So if we look at the top and the bottom, there is a quite a clear uh, distribution. So countries at the bottom of inequality uh, are usually also uh, the richer countries, not all of them, but relatively richer than others. Also, uh, the countries are characterized by being from uh, of Northern Europe or Eastern Europe usually. And on average, they have inequality equal to around uh, 25.6 all in all. The country with the lowest inequality is Slovenia with 24.6, uh, but also a country like Finland, Northern Europe has 27.3, which is also low in an international comparison because countries with most inequality includes, first of all, South Africa. They have a Gini coefficient of 63, which is actually very high. Namibia also very high with 59 and Zambia with 57. The countries here are often characterized by being from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, but also a few from South America. This includes Brazil, uh, 53 and Colombia with 51. So the picture regarding the level of inequality is pretty clear across the world. What about G in inequality? Well, here the picture is more mixed. Uh, so if we look at the countries with the largest reductions in inequality over the past 10 years, we have all the continents represented almost, except for North America. So we have Gambia, one of the highest reductions in inequality, also the United Arab Emirates. We have South America via Bolivia and Paraguay. We have Europe through Estonia and Serbia, and we have Asia through the Philippines. So no exact picture arises there. The same is the situation with the bottom ranking countries, meaning countries who saw an increase in inequality. Among the countries who saw an increase, we have Tanzania, we have uh, Benin and Zimbabwe. They had increases, but you also see we have, for instance, Bulgaria and Luxembourg, they had increases in inequality as well. So all in all, uh, it does not seem as there is a very close relation between level of inequality and the change in inequality. So if we look at the different countries uh, and how they fare compared to each other, we don't see much change in the general level of gene worldwide. And this is the reason we also don't see much convergence in inequality across the globe. This was true for these top and bottom countries, but even if we take all the countries together and on the horizontal axis, you have the Gini level, on the vertical axis, you have the change in Gini. And what do we see? Well, we see there's almost 
no correlation between the two. Again, when we include all the countries that we have, we still see no trend, meaning, again, there do not seem to be convergence in the Gini coefficients. So we cannot expect that high Gini coefficient countries can generally uh, expect a reduction in inequality over time. So this was a brief look at the situation regarding inequality using a traditional measure of inequality. It is now widely believed that in income uh, is not the only way of measuring poverty and welfare in a country. We can then ask maybe why would an income approach be used? And without doubt, uh, it is the most prevalent approach existing. And regarding the question of why we would be using income, it is because this is an easy way of measuring uh, inequality, but it's not the only way and it's not a perfect way at all. Why? The main reason is that welfare, is that really a one-dimensional measure? Not at all. I think we know very well that many other things in life are also important. So as an economist, we talk a lot about utility and utility definitely depends not only on how much you consume, but it also depends on your health. It depends on your feeling of safety. It depends on freedom. But income, of course, is also has some importance. But this is just to say that it is not only income. There are also several other factors which are important for your welfare. So we have new approaches to the measurement of inequality. And we have one approach where you use weightings of different welfare dimensions. This can be a problem sometimes because what weights are you going to use? And how does the result depend on the weights? So some other approaches has also been developed where there's no weighting at all. And this is what we call first order dominance approaches. Let's look at the first one, which is related to weighting schemes. And uh, here I'm looking at uh, the uh, survey from uh, UNDP and OPHI, Oxford Center, uh, and their analysis. And they have developed what we call a multi-dimensional poverty index. It is produced by the UNDP and the uh, OFI. And they just recently published a report, Global Multidimensional Poverty Index 2021, unmasking disparities by ethnicity, caste, and gender. And theoretically, they are following the Al-Qaeda and Fasar 2009 approach. So we just said that welfare is not one dimensional. Okay, then what dimensions could we include here? Well, we can have different kinds of deprivations. First of all, we can have health, but health can be many things. In this case, in this study, they are looking at the nutritional level and they look at child mortality. Also, another important factor is education. And again, you could look at many dimensions, but here we are looking at the number of years of schooling, as well as whether or not people are attending school. And finally, we have the standard of living. Here we are including a, what kind of cooking fuel is used, how is sanitation for the individuals? Do we have safe drinking water? Do we have electricity in the house? What kind of housing do we have? As well as do the household have any assets? Based on that, we can rank the different countries that exist according to this poverty measure. And first of all, we can ask ourselves, does it really matter whether we are using a one-dimensional approach or a multi-dimensional approach? Well, actually in this figure, both the one-dimensional approach and the multi-dimensional approach has been shown. And actually the uh, thin needles that you see represent the one-dimensional monetary approach. And then the bars represent the 
multi-dimensional approach. And what do we see? Well, here we have 60 countries with uh, some information, and we see that in 43 of the 60 countries, the incidence of multidimensional poverty was often much higher than the incidence of monetary poverty. So to the question whether it matters whether we have one dimension or multiple, yes, it does definitely matter, okay? So in many countries, we have a clear, clearly higher poverty, multidimensional poverty compared to monetary poverty. And what does the situation look like here? Well, we see that the, the countries facing the most multidimensional poverty is within the dimensions I talked about. That would be Nigeria. And second most of the countries we are looking at is Mozambique. And we have Benin, we have Sierra Leone, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Malawi, Sudan, and so on. And on the other side, we have almost no multidimensional poverty in countries like Serbia, Georgia, North Macedonia, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Costa Rica, and Thailand, and so on. But those countries still have monetary poverty. Other tables that are produced uh, look like this. We could take uh, the example with uh, Afghanistan. They have a value of the multidimensional poverty index of 0 0.202, which is quite large. 55.6% of the population is poor, according to this measure. And this is, in fact, close to the poverty line measure that is at the left side, right side, sorry. And also, we can see here what causes the high multidimensional poverty? Well, first of all, we can see 10% have health problems, 45% have problems with education, and 45% have problem with standard of living. So for the different countries, you are able to see not only how big is multidimensional poverty, but you're also able to see what contributes to this high poverty among the different uh, dimensions of welfare. What happens over time? Well, first of all, uh, this table is much longer. I'm just showing part of the table. We see that generally there are reductions in the multidimensional poverty index over time. But we also see increase in some places. If we, for instance, look at Benin, initially they had a poverty index of 0.346, and that has slightly increased to 0.362. So although in general, we see a much better condition over time in many countries, there are also countries which are actually backsliding, meaning the multidimensional poverty index is going upwards completely uh, against what we wanted and what we would perhaps expect. Another approach here is the first order dominance approach. And uh, here I will be looking at a study uh, conducted by my colleague Inyaki and uh, myself. This has been published a few years ago and it is about the first order dominance technique and multidimensional poverty indices. And we are trying to compare different approaches to poverty. And this is something which has been published in social indicators research. What dimensions do we have? Well, we have pretty much the same dimensions as in the other study. So we're looking at health, we are looking at education, and we are also looking at living standards. In contrast to before, you can notice we are also including here flooring material uh, in relation to living standards. In contrast to the study before from UNDP, in this study, we have no weighting schemes applied. So we don't say that one welfare dimension is better than another welfare dimension. So how do we get around, nevertheless, ranking countries? 
Well, we will say that country A has higher multidimensional welfare than country B. If country B's welfare distribution can be obtained from country A's welfare distribution by moving probability mass from better to worse in A's distribution. If that is possible with A's distribution and we get B's distribution, then initially A must have been better than country B. So this is how we proceed here. And this is important to notice because no weights are used at all in this case. So what do we get by uh, applying this methodology? Well, we have 48 countries from around the world and we calculate different measures for that. And uh, does it make a difference whether we have a weighting scheme or not? Do we get different results compared to UNDP? when we use our methodology where we have no weighting schemes. Well, there can be actually large differences. Let's look at Bolivia as an example. According to the MPI, they are the 16, 16th rank among the 48 countries we have. But using the first order dominance approach, they are at rank 44, which is a big difference. Is this the only one? No. Let's look at Cambodia. They start out with 22, rank 22 in the MPI, but they are ranked 46 in the FOD. What about Cameroon? Well, they are ranked 29 in MPA, MPI, but 14 in the FOD. So does it matter that we are weighting the different welfare measures? Yes, it can matter quite a lot. And this is why uh, we think that this FOD approach uh, should be an important additional measure uh, to other approaches. I'm not going to go into depth with uh, all the other countries, but you can see here clearly that uh, you have many other countries where you, where you will see a difference in ranking depending on whether we are using uh, one measure or the other. Uh, and you will also see uh, here, uh, you also have some countries where you get exactly the same uh, ranking. And this is true, for instance, for Ukraine, where you have the same ranking, whether it's MPI or whether it is FOD. One thing is you can rank countries according to multi-dimensional welfare. What about first order dominance and the situation happening over time. And here we have a study from Sub-Saharan Africa. And again, this is a study where uh, I was involved uh, together with uh, Channing Arndt, Christian Mark, and Finn Top. And this is something which was published uh, back in 2018. Uh, and here we have a human rights consistent approach to multidimensional welfare measurement applied to Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is published in World Development. So here we are looking at five welfare dimensions rather than three. And we look at whether or not people are deprived with respect to clean water, improved sanitation, whether they, they have proper housing, they are able to communicate, and whether they have a educational level. All of these are dichotomous variables, meaning zero or one, meaning whether or not you have these different items in the household. We are using many countries. And uh, as I said, this is from Sub-Saharan Africa. We don't have surveys from exactly the same year, but we have surveys from different years. And for some countries, there are many years apart. And for other countries, there is few years apart. And we can see the range is everywhere from five to about 14 years. The median range is 14 years. Also, uh, we can see uh, the sample sizes, they are quite large here. And we can see the population in millions in the last column. So what do we see here? Well, we get this picture regarding whether or not there has been a positive development in multi-dimensional welfare over time. 
And what do we see? Well, we see that for many countries, we see an improvement in multidimensional welfare, but also that there has been no improvement in other countries. So, first of all, we see that in countries like Ethiopia, Guinea, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and so on, over five to 13 years, they've had actually an improvement in their overall level of multidimensional welfare. On the other hand, over a 14-year 14, 14 period, there has been no broadly based improvement in welfare in countries like Cameroon, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Gabon, and Nigeria, and so on. So just to repeat, when we are using countries as the counting unit, we did not see much reduction in inequality levels across the world. Also, too narrow to not if we too narrow to look only at income, uh, although income is actually very important for many welfare dimensions that we will see. Also, we can say that multidimensional approaches to the analysis of inequality and poverty is required if we want to have a, a more a nuanced look at inequality. And finally, what we must also remember is that when we use a multidimensional approach, the weighting schemes becomes a central issue because whether we weight or not, we will get different rankings. And the approach I'm using together with my colleagues is without weights. And that can be uh, an advantage uh, in a sense, uh, because it is a problem to find out exactly what weights to use. Thank you. Over to you, Paul. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Azar. So that was very informative. And at this point, of course, we will welcome uh, questions from our participants. So if you have any questions regarding the presentation that was made by Dr. Azar, please you may proceed to use the Q&A button and then I'll read out these questions to him to answer. Uh, so this one is from, uh, Professor Lalima Mukaji. So this is a nice presentation, but would have been more if you had India been included. Okay. So I expect that in future presentation, we'd like to talk about inequality uh, in India. So uh, she's saying that maybe we can have a little bit more focus on India as well uh, to try and understand what is the scenario there in terms of income inequality in, in India. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll just have uh, one or two questions uh, before, uh, so before uh, maybe if you have any questions from our participants, I'll read them to you. So uh, my, I think my question is more like uh, two in one. So uh, what, what would be the basic uh, uh, measurements of, of income inequality uh, and, and how much has income inequality increased over the past few decades uh, in this in the global south in terms of emerging market. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, measurement is usually uh, uh, done in terms of uh, the Gini coefficient. Uh, but as I said, I think Gini coefficient is uh, one way of measuring, uh, but uh, we definitely also have other ways. Uh, and what I I'm arguing is that uh, we should uh, try to have a more a broad look at welfare, uh, meaning we should be using additional uh, measure uh, and not only the Gini coefficient. But nevertheless, if we talk about the Gini coefficient and if we talk about uh, the emerging markets, so some of the emerging markets that we're looking at, we had Brazil before, and uh, at least in, uh, in that country, you see a very high uh, inequality. And uh, also in other countries, which has had rapid economic growth, uh, we tend to see an increase in inequality. Uh, it doesn't mean that people are getting poorer necessarily. Uh, actually, you could have a situation where uh, welfare is actually increasing in general, but the distance between the bottom and the top is increasing. And this is often what you would see also in emerging markets. So 
maybe you can call this, you know, uh, the backside of uh, development or the backside of growth. Uh, maybe you can call it a necessary evil uh, that, that is debatable. Uh, but this is uh, often uh, what you see. Uh, and this is true for the many of the countries which are uh, emerging. Okay. So I think uh, I'm allowing um, that uh, Professor Pradhan, uh, who is a governing council member, because I know you are aware, uh, he wants to uh, make some quick comments. So Professor Pradhan, please, you are allowed, you can speak now. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Paul, and thank you, uh, Dr. Hussain. Uh, extremely glad to hear your brilliant presentation and, ex and, and very good empirical study. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think I, I just want to raise a broader issue on income inequality and get your thoughts on that a bit. Uh, I think a cross-country study that you have done has uh, merits a lot of attention, bring in a lot of dimensions to understand the income inequality. But what I'm trying to uh, see is that you see, the income inequality broadly uh, emanates or generates, uh, the, you know, uh, from uh, possibly the way sources of income or employment is generated in an economy. And with the new economy today and the e-commerce and or or the uh, you know kind of uh, the kind of uh, uh, data-driven system that is coming up and uh, the supply chain networks developing. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of alternate sources of income uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is emerging today in many economies. Uh, and, and most importantly, the asset market, for example, whether it's equity market and real estate, so, you know, or even cryptocurrencies, the asset markets are also creating, uh, you know, kind of income divergence uh, in, in, in societies. Uh, so therefore, uh, I think uh, looking from this uh, this angle, uh, even COVID uh, period and and the associated uh, rise in the uh, you know bubble in the asset prices like equity also has created a lot of income inequalities for earners uh, in financial market. But at the same time, people in the informal sector uh, who uh, lost their jobs or were locked. You know, we're out of jobs for, for almost uh, a, a year or so, lost a lot of income. And, and uh, so therefore, I, I tend to believe that going forward or what remains in future uh, in this domain of research, uh, how, how does one uh, tries to understand uh, the sources of income inequality uh, or, or the interventions that government need to make or, or kind of implications of things like COVID and, you know, uh, which has created so much of in, in, uh, imbalance in income. And I'll be glad to have, I mean, uh, though this may be beyond the scope of your paper, but I just thought having uh, you being an expert to get a bit reflection on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, So I think, uh, okay, you want to say something, please? Oh, oh, I don't know. Should I answer now or? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Pratan. Good, uh, good uh, questions uh, you have there. No, no, I, I, I totally agree that uh, the development on the stock market, uh, the development of uh, capital income uh, and so on are among some of the very important drivers of uh, inequality uh, uh, nowadays. And uh, so, so uh, I think that we agree there. Uh, regarding uh, government intervention, uh, there I want to actually to emphasize a little bit the situation also in Europe, because I'm now sitting here in the in the Danish welfare state, one of the most advanced welfare states in the world, together with uh, Sweden, together with Finland, together with Norway, some of the uh, 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 countries with the highest uh, benefit levels, low unemployment levels, and a lot of support from the government. Nevertheless, also in very advanced welfare nations like uh, the Nordic countries, you have seen an increase in inequality over the past few decades. So I'm sure uh, something can be done, some can be, uh, and also the government is trying their best. But even as I said, in countries where they have reduced inequality a lot, 
Even in these countries, we have seen increases in inequality in the past uh, decades. Uh, so what to do uh, about this? It's, it's, it's really a, a good question. Uh, and of course, first of all, what we need to maybe to find out is what are, are the drivers? And then next, it will be perhaps easier to say something about uh, what uh, we can do about it. Uh, but surely, uh, some of the things which can raise at least the bottom in a country is uh, making sure that we have more education, uh, higher skill levels for also the bottom of uh, the income distribution that could be uh, among some of the important things. Whether you transfer money to the bottom of the income distribution and that should lower inequality. Well, uh, if you look at, if one looks at it that way, maybe uh, it is something which could work. But of course, uh, increasing uh, transfers, uh, first of all, there could be some problems with uh, uh, work incentives, maybe. The other thing is that if you want to uh, transfer more money, you also need to increase taxes, okay? And increasing taxes is not popular. Well, it's not popular among the electorate. That's one problem. Uh, but also, secondly, uh, increasing taxes maybe could also uh, uh, make pro give problems regarding uh, work incentives for richer people. Okay. So please, uh, oh, uh, Paul. Uh, Paul. Well, can I respond just quickly one second? Hello. Yes, Prof, please proceed. Uh, no, I, I think excellent, uh, Dr. Sen, and uh, you are absolutely right. The transfers uh, have been one of the instrument for, you know, kind of bringing income, uh, uh, I mean, uh, addressing income inequality. And, uh, but I think the governments uh, uh, have used transfers, I think as a subsistence more rather than upscaling uh, or enhancing the, 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 you know, skill level uh, uh, would be more desirable, as you rightly said. And I think access to information, access to uh, markets, access to uh, resources, uh, including education and skills and capital, I think they would be more enduring and more more rewarding to the poor, and uh, they, somehow the the government uh, depends primarily on transfers, who, who probably uh, look at more to provide enough subsistence for, for people uh, to survive. And I think, uh, if not in Africa, but major part of the world, I think uh, the hunger and malnutrition. Uh, they, they do remain, but have been addressed to a large extent by government in transfer. But what is needed is how poor can take advantage of this growing economy. That actually would be one of the main driver of reducing income. But thank you very much, Dr. Orson. Lovely presentation and lovely listening to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Dr. Orson, please, you may end your screen share. I think you are still your screen. So I think Dr. Lalima Mukaji um, wants to make a comment. So I'll allow her as well. Hello, Dr. Lalima. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Paul. Good evening, Azar, sir. Good evening, Paul. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Uh, first, I would like to uh, say my heartfelt thanks to Azar, sir, because it was a very, very enriching kind of a presentation. Uh, kind of reiterated certain concepts and kind of uh, reiterated uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, con I will not say the concepts, the ideas which uh, we always uh, try to understand. I have few very simple questions. Uh, one is when you are talking about the indicators, you are talking about health, you are talking about education, and you are continuously saying that multidimensional uh, indicators are measures are more important than the monetary measure, which is a very important uh, kind of a, a you know point for us. We have known that we always uh, used to believe that uh, previously that uh, income source and uh, income in the hands of the poor people are more important. People are very poor because they do not have the perfect source of income. But of late, which has come up uh, in front of us specifically, uh, like you are one of the veteran economists uh, who is working on all this. What I have seen is 
uh, rather than source of income, what you have pointed out, health and education, uh, poverty in terms of health and education facilities, or I will say, if I talk about my country as India, uh, uh, some kind of similar uh, things have been, you have shown uh, that is in most of the countries like uh, Africa, uh, that is uh, the, the poverty which we have in having lesser amount of educational awareness in terms of infrastructure and most importantly health if we talk about health infrastructure so my question to you is how you being a, an economist who works with uh, who is a macroeconomist or who deals with uh, inequalities in terms of uh, you know all kinds of poverty because the term poverty has changed we all know uh, it is not only for uh, income. So all kinds of, with all these kinds of properties, how actually you think that it will be possible to bring these developing countries out of the poverty, uh, you know, situation in which they are in. We have a lot of, you know, researches. We do a lot of researches, even uh, the uh, last year's uh, Nobel laureate, who is from India, Avijit V. Banerjee and uh, Esther Duflo, uh, Michael Kramer, uh, they have also, uh, in fact, they have also come up with facts like people should be given, you know, uh, money in their hands and things like that. My, my simple question is, do you think that if I assume that there is a health infrastructure, there is a education infrastructure, and they have money in their hands. But do you think they have the awareness of how to spend this or how to have the best out of all this? Do you have that awareness? Do you think that is uh, more important or not? No, these are, thank you, uh, Dr. Dalima. That is really uh, good questions, but also I would say big questions. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, the question about whether uh, or not uh, it's enough to have money, and if you had the infrastructure, uh, would people still uh, uh, be able to get out of poverty? If so if if, if I can if I can interrupt you a bit, I'm sorry for this. I would just like to put an example in front of you. That that example is from India, from my state, West Bengal. Uh, if a very poor person who is uh, who pulls rickshaw right that or, or or maybe a van puller if you give money in his hand he would be going uh, uh, to a liquor shop than to a staple food necessity shop so i was trying to you know uh, focus on that yeah thank you sorry so, yeah no no you you could be absolutely right and maybe that's why the money should not be given to uh, the man it should be given to uh, his wife uh, probably i think uh, that would be one step at least uh, in the right direction and i completely agree with you i mean it is a big uh, question you know uh, should one give the money and if you give the money uh, what will exactly happen and i think uh, one could make some interesting analysis you know getting around this problem and make some experiments in some surveys where you are actually able to handle uh, this uh, question. Uh, you know, what happens, you know, with uh, people uh, at different income levels who might get uh, uh, government support? What happens? How do they spend the money? And uh, depending on who gets it, uh, depending on the family situation, who spends the money, how do they spend it? So I think this is really, these are all really good questions. And, uh, and uh, I'm afraid that there's no really a final answer to that. Uh, but 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 I think this is something one should definitely look into, and I think this is something which is possible to look into because one could include some questions in existing surveys. You know, there's already a, a survey taking uh, taking uh, being conducted, and maybe one could include some relevant questions where you are exactly able to analyze uh, this part. The other thing you are saying about uh, health, I think this is uh, equally important. Uh, again, I want to make a comparison a little bit also with uh, the situation in Northern Europe. I, I analyze a lot of data for developing countries, but I actually also analyze a lot of data for uh, Denmark and European Union countries. And right now we have a project going on analyzing the situation in all EU member states and how uh, health problems affects your chances of being employed. And again, just like uh, I talked with uh, uh, Professor Prat Han uh, about before, 
even in advanced countries, rich countries, European countries, uh, there are clear negative uh, employment effects, clear negative poverty effects of bad health. So this is a fundamental problem. Uh, and uh, getting back to uh, how to solve the problem, well, I think this is a big question, but no doubt. Almost no matter what you're looking at, good education, better education leads the way out of poverty, leads the way to prosperity and so on. This is true for developing countries. This is true for richer countries. Yeah, true. Thank you so much, sir. I would like to talk to you in person regarding certain other questions also, which is not possible right now. So if you if you don't mind, so I would be uh, in that case, I would be disturbing you a bit regarding these things. No, you're most welcome. You're most welcome. I would yeah. like to. Okay, I would I would personally contact you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank sure. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very Thank you. much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pradhan and Dr. Lalima, for the inputs and for the questions. I think you brought up a bit of other angles that made the conversation very interesting. So in the absence of any uh, questions from our participants, I think at this point, we will say a very big thank you to uh, Dr. Mohammed Azar Hussein, uh, who is a professor of uh, economics and statistics at the Royal University, also a member of the International Board. <coughs> ICC for sharing this insight with us. Mm -hmm. so this uh, session is being recorded and of course we'll make it available on our YouTube channel which will be shared with all participants via our website as well as well as our social media platforms. So we'll come your way again, again uh, with future uh, uh, platform, future events and hopefully uh, we'll get to, I think someone has raised their hands. Yes. Yes, yes, Paul, I would just like to thank you. you. I'd like to thank, thank the uh, attendants. Thank you so much. Yes, you're welcome. So thank you very much, and we'll, we'll catch up.